My name is Bernice Lee. I'm the research director for energy, environment and resources here at Chatham House. It gives me great pleasure today to be chairing this meeting with Parakana. It's in fact, it's a treat to be chairing Parakana, who is Senior Research Fellow at the New America Foundation, Senior Fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations and Visiting Fellow at LSE Ideas. And actually, I'm pretty sure that he has other affiliation, like the director of the Hybrid Reality Institute. He's, as you know, published very widely on issues around globalization and the new world order. And this is the part I, I particularly appreciate. And in 2008, he was named as one of Esquire's most uh, 75 most influential people of the 21st century. Esquire. So I was just looking at his attire and thinking <laughs> that it is indeed very befitting. He's often quoted around the world and you would have no doubt heard him on television, on radio and many other things. Now today he has a very important task of connecting the dots for us. He's arguing that many random events or seemingly random events are in fact unified by one theme called globalization mm -hmm. and that as we become truly global in the 21st century it will present many new challenges for us. Parak, would you help us connect the dots? Sure. Thank you. It's, uh, it's always a great pleasure to be here uh, in this room, in this building. I have a, a special connection to this place that actually does go back to around uh, 2008. I put it on flight mode, yeah. <laughs> which I don't actually do on the plane. Shh, don't. Um, but uh, it's that my, my first book was, was based on the, the writings, the late writings of Arnold Toynbee, who was one of the, the directors and in-house historians in this, in this place about a half century ago. Um, and so it's always a special occasion for me to, to come back here. But unless you're talking about under fives, I was going to say uh, there, are, there, are no, there are no more young leaders versus old leaders. They're just leaders, right? There's enough people from our generation who are considered leaders that are young that mingle with and co-direct the world uh, with the old that I don't, I don't really think that it's even necessary anymore to distinguish between young and old leaders per se. But that's, that's, a, that's a separate point. Uh, and maybe globalization has something to do with that. Um, and to connect the dots, I think you know, the, the first, um, in the, basically three things that I wanted to just you know, superficially skim over this evening. The first is the future of globalization. Because I found it interesting that in the last 10 years, we've heard on several notable occasions that globalization was going to stop or retrench or reverse. You've heard Nouriel Roubini say it. You've heard lots of people go on television and write articles saying that after 9-11, east-west mistrust, you know, lack of understanding, suspicion, tension, spiking commodities prices, so forth, uh, globalization would retrench. And you heard it with the collapse of the Doha trade round. Uh, globalization is finished. You can't continue to have globalization unless you have a global trade deal. Lo and behold, globalization continues. Then you had the financial crisis. And on the aftermath of that, still to this day, you hear people saying globalization is doomed. As far as I can see, globalization is not only alive and well, but it's, it's thriving like never before in human history. So I don't know if I'm looking at the same globalization as other people. My presumption is that the people who say that are very Eurocentric people, or Western-centric people, because they're not, their newspapers and their media aren't telling them about the summits and the trade negotiations and the agreements and the flows of commodities and investment that are happening between Latin America and Africa, and Africa and India, and India and China, and China and Africa. Last time I checked, that fits the definition of globalization too. Just because it doesn't come from Paris or London or New York, it doesn't mean it's not globalization. What's actually happening today is that for the first time in all of history, globalization is actually global. So the term that so many of you have written papers about and, and many, many people are sick of using, it's such a mouthful after all, is actually really happening now for, for the first time. Globalization in the past has been either a one-way street, directed by the West or directed by whichever hegemonic power there was at the time, or it certainly wasn't global per se, right? not reaching every part of the world. You could have entire conversations about globalization and world order up until 10 years ago and you wouldn't have to mention Latin America or Africa. No one would even notice in the room if you didn't mention Latin America or Africa, unless there was a Brazilian or South African in the room. You can't do that anymore. When you talk about globalization today, you talk about the emerging markets, the frontier markets, the natural resources, the human, potent the human capital, and the growth that is happening in all parts of the world. 
So the fact that we now live in a world of globalized globalization, a globalization that is completing itself geographically, is, it's reached its maximum width, right? It includes everyone, even, even North Korea more and more. Um, and now it's just getting deeper and more intense internally amongst the, the, all the nodes. So I think that, that's really the first point I wanted to make. And I think that helps people to connect the dots because I think previous maps of the world, mental maps of the world, didn't even include all the dots, not even all the, the, geo, the geographical dots. So that's the, the, first, the first thing that I think is really important for us to understand in terms of where we stand right now at this moment. The second is that the tools and the frameworks that we've used for so long to understand global change are a bit antiquated. Uh, to, put it, to put it mildly. Um, now that's, that's a commonly heard refrain. Everyone has their own take on it. My, my uh, view is the following. Geopolitics, uh, which you know, in many ways has its origins and activities in and around this building in the 19th century and in Germany and Sweden, um, it is a 19th century discipline. Uh, you know, was a very legitimate way uh, of viewing the world. When you hear the word geopolitics, what do you think of? You think of balance of power, uh, military force, natural resources, demographic size, um, uh, armaments, power projection capability, things like this, the things that are normally connoted by the, the term. About, say, 15, 20 years ago, people started talking about geoeconomics uh, as a rival approach or lens or paradigm. Uh, the idea that, no, it's not just about uh, tanks and troops and warheads, it's about um, uh, currency reserves, terms of trade, balance of payments, uh, uh, foreign investment, uh, all of these kinds of things. And that, that is obviously also valid in its own way. And there appeared this divide between the proponents of geoeconomics on the one hand and geopolitics on the other, as if one represented the 20th century in the future and the other was kind of back, backwards. I think that's been a false debate all along. I think that if you were to create a sort of axis, you know, geopolitics, geoeconomics, there's a third corner of a triangle that's been missing in our conversation. And that's what I call geotechnology. And I think if you Google it, it's my term, I'm very pleased to say. Uh, I need to buy a copyright or something on that because I'm writing a book about it right now and I think, I think it's a very useful concept. And what geotechnology argues is that, in fact, it is technology that has always been the driver of geoeconomic and geopolitical change. And it's been either an oversight um, or it simply just hasn't been uh, brought into the kind of the schools of thought that are dominated by social scientists, which probably many of you are like me, people who are not properly educated in economics or technology and studied philosophy and history. Um, in ways that simply didn't bring out these very important disciplines and, and, and lenses of, of understanding change. And I think that's a huge problem, that, that our reigning sort of diplomatic caste and, and political leadership in the West, and this is something that many people complain about, don't have a sufficient understanding of economics and of technology. So a lot of what I've tried to catch up with in my own life and, and, and education, post-formal education, is economics and technology. And I've come to realize that, that this triangle is, is the triangle that I wish I had been taught going back to when I was a teenager. And I'll give you some examples of why, why it makes a lot of sense. Answer the following question. Why is China a superpower today? Why do you call it a superpower? Is it because it now has, how many, 150 nuclear weapons? I don't know, I'm just guessing. It doesn't really matter. You only need 10 to scare the world, right? Um, is it a, because, it a, because it has 150 nuclear weapons and uh, 20 years ago it had 80 or 90? Is that why you now consider it a superpower? Probably not, right? Because you probably don't know how many nuclear weapons it has and it doesn't really matter. Or do you consider China a superpower? Because starting in the 1970s, 1980s, it began to open its economy, undertake uh, mass uh, industrialization, modernized its manufacturing sector, uh, captured in a way that sector, became the world's factory floor, uh, accrued massive um, um, revenues, foreign exchange reserves, and has converted that into infrastructure investment, investment in its military, and, and so on. That might be why you consider China a superpower today, right? And has undertaken a massive international binge of commodities uh, acquisition, and so on. So what is the chain of causality here? China opened its economy. It 
focus on one sector, one technology sector, manufacturing, and it captured it. Now it leads the entire world in it and is putting everyone else out of business in it almost. And that's what allowed it to build the foreign exchange reserves, the capital to do the investment, the geoeconomic power. And that then is now being invested massively, as you know, every single year its military budget increases in its geopolitical capability. What, what was the correct chronological flow of China's increase in power in the last 30 years? Was it geopolitical stuff first, the military stuff? Was it the economic things first or was it the technology first? It was the technology. Why don't we see it that for what it, for what it is in terms of the proper chain? Right? Because we look at the superficial indicators, the size of its military, the size of its navy, the fact that it purchased an aircraft carrier last year is useless uh, uh, contraption uh, as it is, the one that it bought at least. Um, so I think that it's extremely important. Now, I, I, I emphasize that it's a triangle because I don't discount geopolitics that I, I spent years studying, and I don't discount geoeconomics. They have an integral, sort of, you know, an intimate interrelationship. The reason is that, in fact, the, 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 the substance of geotechnology, as I'm calling it, is embedded very much in geopolitical theory. It's just in various obscure parts of it that, that, that were sort of, you know, have been neglected for decades. But there is, there is an important approach called leading sector analysis. And what it does is it looks at, in any given uh, period or era or economic cycle, what are the key technology clusters that drive uh, commercialization, economic advantage, and, and, and so forth. And that, that theory should be alive and well today. Because if ever we lived in an age where we need to explore and understand key technological sectors and how they're being um, researched and developed and commercialized and so forth, it's, it's now. Because it's not just industrial technology, it's not just uh, military armament, it's biotechnology, it's nanotechnology, it's alternative energy, it's advanced manufacturing, it's artificial intelligence and robotics, it's all of these different things. These are all very crucial sectors, technology clusters today. All of them are going to be extremely important in the 21st century. Whoever has the edge in those sectors is going to be able to sell them, export them, build massive profits and convert that into strategic gain and advantage. So I'm making this argument that geotechnology is, is a perspective that we need to start to, to use as our, as our dominant or primary lens in understanding, in understanding economic growth and understanding geopolitical change in the 21st century. And that, that's something that I think is, is, is essential. Um, the, third, the third thing I was going to say is that these technologies and the power that is derived from them is not controlled only and exclusively by states anymore. Now this is obviously not new news uh, to anyone here, but it's the way we think about the role of non-state actors. There is a view that says they're marginal and irrelevant and sovereignty and territoriality still matters above all else. There's a view that says, well, there, we still live in a very much a state-based system, and these kinds of actors, even if they're powerful corporations like, like defense contractors or oil companies or Google, well, they're still just marginal peripheral players, but we acknowledge that they can influence agendas. Or there's a view that says, it's all up for grabs. Whoever has the money can you know, control the land, can buy off supply chains, can, can have a voice in power and territorial power doesn't mean everything anymore. I fall in that third camp. Some would say it's a bit on a limb. I think it'll, it's just becoming more and more obvious over time. And if you don't share that view yet, I think you will. Uh, and no matter how powerful our greatest powers today become, I don't think that they'll be able to put that genie back in the bottle. The term to describe that phenomenon is systems change. And I think it's the third thing that I think you know, I want to share as, as a concept that's, that's a, it's a very old idea, but that is extremely relevant today. Because any one of us could give an, you know, an hours long lecture on rising powers. I mean, if you're not familiar with the idea of rising powers and pivotal states and multipolarity, you know, uh, everyone by now is. You take for granted that it's not a unipolar world anymore the way it was in the 1990s. That whole phenomenon, that whole discourse the whole, you know, thousands of books, and I've written just one of them <laughs> on this topic, it all fits into uh, what you'd call structural change. Structural change is when you move from a unipolar world to a multipolar world or a multipolar world to a unipolar world. That's, again, fairly obvious to everyone. The debate is actually about systems change, which is a much deeper phenomenon that takes much longer to unfold, 
that happens maybe you know once or twice every thousand years, whereas structural change, rising powers, rising, falling, that happens every 50 or 100 years. I think we're living through a period of systems change in which you change the nature of the units that drive, that drive politics, that drive economics, that drive everything. And this means that a Google or a Gates Foundation or an Al Qaeda or an Oxfam or, or Facebook or whatever the case may be is not a flash in the pan kind of thing. I consider these actors to be authorities. And, and, and the essential sort of move is where you start to realize that, that diplomacy is not just about states. Power is not just about states. It's not just about sovereignty, it's about authority. And you recognize as an authority uh, you know, religious groups and companies and so forth, those who, who provide for you, those who you uh, give certain loyalty to. And I find more and more that the more, the more countries we have in the world, when the United Nations was founded, we had less than 70 countries. Today we have three times that many countries. Most of the countries in the world that exist today didn't exist like 60, 70 years ago. You find a growing number of fragile, illegitimate uh, states. Most of the post-colonial world is made up of such states. Many of the, much of the Arab Spring can be explained as, the, as a slow uh, collapse of the post-colonial order, which is why I believe, as an aside, that what we're seeing in the Arab Spring, we'll probably see in dozens more countries. And I said dozens, I mean many, many, many more countries. The underlying conditions that gave rise to the Arab Spring, overpopulation, poor infrastructure, corrupt governance, youth bulge, unemployment, that's not just an Arab phenomenon. It's most of the world. It's most of the planet. So if the world is full of such illegitimate states, then legitimacy, authority, these things are just ripe for the taking. Right? Whichever corporate supply chain provides jobs, whichever bank provides stable access to capital, whichever social media network you know, gives you access to the world, that, that's where your loyalty is going to go. And yes, of course, you, know, you still have this stubborn sort of passport in your hand, which is, which is actually part of why I make this argument, because I meet uh, people your age, younger, who are in business schools in, in the West, but come from, from, from China, India, Brazil, wherever, and they, um, their big complaint is their nationality. They're not, they're not happy with their nationality, because as much as their countries may be getting powerful, their passports still say they need to go and prostrate in front of a US consular officer to get out of their country. Whereas if they work for McKinsey or Goldman Sachs or whatever, then they can kind of more or less go wherever they want, wherever they please. Their loyalty is shifting. And then that surely applies to, to many of you, depending on where you're from. So I see this slow, gradual shift in who has the power, whether it's capital, whether it's resources, whether it's loyalty, whether it's their membership base, whether it's your Facebook group, or whether it's the, whether it's the fact that you know, Apple has $100 billion, which is larger than the GDP of 100 countries, right? And it has no debt, unlike Greece, <laughs> you know. Um, so I, for, for a whole host of reasons, I think that we are undergoing this kind of systems change. You see it within countries, you see it transnationally, uh, and we can kind of debate it, I think, the right way to under, think about it and measure it so that one doesn't appear too superficial in this analysis is sort of sector by sector, you know. Mm. If you look at health, if you, uh, healthcare provision, if you look at security provision, right? Uh, you know, I, I like to say Max Weber has a problem today, right? I mean, if, if the monopoly of the use of force is, 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 is something that is the sole preserve of the state, then why is it that there are 1,700 unique identified militia groups that are active in the world today according to a database uh, compiled by Tufts University, right? There's 200 states, 1,700 militias, something doesn't quite add up, right? So that's just one example. So take it sector by sector, whether it's education provision or health or, 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 or security or, you know, and, and all these kinds of things. The, 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 the tasks and responsibilities of the state you find um, are more and more not filled by the state. They're filled by other kinds of authorities. So I think we should be looking much more at authorities than sovereignties in terms of uh, understanding who the key players are in a world of systems change. And again, you know, what gives one power in this world of systems change is, you know, again, control over technology, leverage of technology, right? And how does technology spread? Of course, more rapidly than ever because of globalization and the expansion of globalization. So that, in a nutshell, is how I would connect the dots. Brilliant. Well, shall we? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you.